the forces of conservatism, it would appear, had triumphed after the final defeat of Napoleon in 1815. The Congress of Vienna restored conservative regimes in most of the states following the reorganization of Europe uh, after Napoleon's defeat. Conservatism in a way became the ideology of the ruling classes in Europe in the early 19th century. It was an ideology of politics and diplomacy which expressed itself more in terms of practical politics than in theoretical terms. In a way, the new ministers uh, were not really new. Many of them were old and had been in a way uh, the successors of the ministers of absolute, uh, uh, absolutism of the Enlightenment period. Metternich of Austria or Mojelas of Bavaria, for example, had started their career under Joseph II or Leopold II of Austria, the enlightened despots. Conservatism, however, as recent historians have argued, was not a static philosophy. Conservatism was not necessarily uh, against all change, yet the need for stability was so overwhelming that it tended to preclude possibilities of change through reform. The conservative order as it was <coughs> reconstructed after uh, 1815 sought two things basically. One, to preserve the status quo uh, prior to 1789 and this would have meant excluding all changes that the French Revolution or the newfangled ideas of uh, liberalism, nationalism or democracy had brought about. Secondly, they wanted stability and uh, wanted to preserve the borders as they had been redrawn after 1815. There were two levels at uh, uh, which this was working. Internationally speaking, there was the so-called concert of Europe. The concert of Europe was the combination of the four powers, Austria, uh, Britain, Prussia and Russia, which uh, created the fourth coalition to finally defeat Napoleon. The concert of Europe had two basic uh, planks as it were. The first was the quadruple alliance, which was the alliance of all these four powers. They had decided to remain united for at least 20 years even after the defeat of Napoleon to prevent any recrudescence of the phenomenon of Napoleon or any upsetting of the balance of power. In, to achieve this end, they had decided to meet in periodic congresses to try and solve the problems as and when they cropped up. A second part of this uh, so-called concert of Europe was the holy alliance which was uh, proposed by the Russian Tsar Alexander II. Alexander had proposed that all the states of Europe must conduct their affairs on the basis of Christian principles of love, peace and charity. Obviously, this is not the stuff of pragmatic or practical politics. Indeed, it was uh, uh, described by contemporaries as high sounding nothing and a piece of political, uh, 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 a piece of sublime mysticism and nonsense. But as Metternich had put in his memoirs, they probably tried to please the Tsar by signing the so called Holy Alliance because the argument was that no harm would come of it. But later historians, some historians have uh, reinterpreted the real intent of the Holy Alliance. They see in this the real instrument of intervention in the internal affairs of the various states which were experiencing movements for change. The concert of Europe met in four 
congresses between 1818 and 23. The first was, was at Aix-la-Chapelle. At the Aix-la-Chapelle conference, they simply readmitted France as a full member of the European concert again. France had paid off the indemnity. Uh, uh, the uh, occupation army left France after the indemnity had been paid off. But while France was readmitted, the four powers secretly renewed their old quadruple alliance against France. So, this is a very interesting part of the entire process. And the second meeting at Tropo, things seem to be stirring a little, particularly in Germany and elsewhere, the forces of change were astir once more and this was a signal for the powers to try and do something. Metternich uh, and the Russian Tsar were together in adopting what was what came to be known as the protocol of Tropo. This protocol indeed authorized the various members of the concert to intervene in the internal affairs of countries if it became necessary. Metternich also used his personal uh, position in Germany as the president of the confederation to introduce the Kalba decrees we sought to contain the popular movements which appeared to be burgeoning. The next two congresses at Leibach and Verona came in the context of more serious uprisings in Piedmont and Naples in Italy and in Spain. And now they had decided to use the principle of intervention without any qualm whatsoever. France sent an army into Spain to quell the Spanish uprising, which had earlier succeeded in securing the old constitution of 1812. Metternich sent in his army, the Austrian army, into Piedmont, Sardinia and Naples to quell the disturbances there. This, however, appeared to be the high water mark of the uh, concert of Europe. Already within the concert, there had been a difference of opinion developing. We, England was on the one side and Austria and Russia on the other. Well, Austria and Russia wanted the concert to act as a dam against the rising tide of change, you know, revolutionary change or nationalism, liberalism, etc. Britain wanted it to use rather as a Swiss gate to allow a measured flow of change. This became very clear when Castlery, after the intervention in, in Spain, issued his celebrated state paper in which he said that intervention in the affairs of internal affairs of other countries would be uh, impracticable, impractical and objectionable and he wanted the alliance to be kept within a, the limits of common sense. Now this became increasingly clear as Greece started its war of independence against the Ottoman Turks. The Greek war of independence continued without any intervention, though both Britain and Russia were keen to intervene here. When there was an insurrection for a liberal constitution in Portugal, Britain intervened with a paradoxical motive of preventing intervention. But what really sounded the death knell of the concert, uh, as it were, was the promulgation of the Monroe Doctrine by the American President Monroe. He said that America is for the Americans. It was a warning against the Europeans to continue to intervene in uh, America, in the American continent. Indeed, the Spanish colonies in, the South, in South America, as well as Brazil, Brazil, broke away from Spain and Portugal and in spite of their best intentions, neither Austria nor Russia could do anything to intervene here. And this, with this, with the, after the Congress of Verona in 1823, the concert uh, lost most of its purposes and at least its organization. But what was an interesting experiment uh, here was the attempt at supranational government. The concert, as it were, 
was seeking to act as a, a transnational organization that would have the right to arbiter the destinies of all the states of Europe in a manner of speaking. Metternich had been the Chancellor of Austria from 1809 to 1848 and indeed has been widely claimed as the conservative conscience of Europe. He dominated the politics of Europe from 1815 to 48 at any rate and uh, was truly a minister of European conservatism. As the Chancellor of Austria, Metternich had the difficult task of presiding over a multiracial, polyglot and autocratic empire. This meant that the forces of nationalism and liberalism were virtually anathema to him. He was not expected, he knew that nationalism would lead to the liquidation of the empire and therefore Metternich gradually adopted policies which uh, were imparted a degree of rigidity to them and there was hardly any possibility of change. Apart from Metternich's concern for Austria, he had the additional responsibility of Germany as the president of the confederation. The Holy Roman Empire had collapsed after Napoleon's uh, assault in 1806, but Austria was made the president of the confederation of the German states in uh, 1815. In Italy also, Lombardy and Venetia were directly ruled by Austria and there were a number of Habsburg princes in the central parts of the peninsula. Metternich also tried to influence the policies of Sardinia, Piedmont, the, the, ruled by the House of Savoy and Naples and Sicily. So Metternich's basic task was to preserve status quo, autocracy and generally speaking the old order in this vast and diverse part over which he had responsibilities. Metternich had his critics among contemporaries. Castlery of England described him as a political harlequin and Talleyrand of France complained of his inconceivable superficiality. But Metternich has it, had his supporters as well. Indeed, it is possible to see three distinct historiographical trends in the discussions about Metternich. The first of all was, uh, first of these was put forward by Metternich himself in his memoirs. In this, he tended to see himself as the savior of Europe. He claimed to have rescued Europe from chaos and disorder by some superb uh, statesmanship. While there uh, used to be a consensus that Metternich in achieving or in implementing his policies had virtually created a system, Metternich himself denied having devised any such system. He simply said that he had a Weltordnung, a world order. What he had done was to perceive this world order which in his argument was based on deep and immutable laws. He had simply discerned these laws and tried to construct his policies on the basis of these laws. And here he had virtually uh, created a structure that became very rigid uh, to, to begin with. For him, the rulers are divine sanctioned rulers of a kingdom and therefore they must be suffered on pains of impiety or even blasphemy. He believed that the states are virtually the personal estates of the monarchs. People scarcely existed for him. Governance or the matter of the rulers and his ministers and society does not require any other element of cohesion than a blind 
and total obedience to the monarch. He supported a centralization and the autocratic uh, structure of the empire or if we may put it in another way, he felt it was his responsibility to keep this structure intact. Metternich drew his inspiration from reason. Bark, another major conservative, drew his sustenance from history. To Metternich, it was reason. Reason for him was a sufficient basis for his ideology, for his uh, policies. He, he felt that the world had changed since the early modern period, since the time of the Renaissance and the Reformation. The invention of gunpowder, the, 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 the reformation uh, movements and the decline in the value of land as the only source of wealth had somewhat altered the society. Now, when he recognized this, he did not have any idea of how this would be changed. In his world, there was no place for either nationalism or liberal, liberalism. Because nationalism or ethnic minority or, 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 or granting rights to the ethnic minorities would have eaten into the centralized empire that Austria had been. And this is why he was obviously against liberalism as well. He did not want change, he did not want participatory governance and he was against revolution. He denounced on revolution a wealth of metaphorical denunciation. Revolution was for him a volcano that must be extinguished, a disease that must be cured a gangrene burned with hot iron, a hydra with uh, jaws open to swallow uh, the social order. So, all this must be totally negated and uh, nothing should be spared to prevent revolution from coming. He developed his ideas and his so-called system in logical terms. The newfangled ideas as we have seen so far was totally against what Metternich uh, could or could not do. And therefore, for him the main slogan was govern and change nothing. This is the message that he sent to all his contemporaries to the other rulers of, of Europe. Now, Having looked at this historiographical position, we can suggest that Metternich uh, uh, had mainly three major objectives in what he was doing. He was determined to preserve status quo, whether of 1815 or of a period before 1789. He wanted to preserve the boundaries drawn or redrawn in 1815 by the Congress of Vienna and third, he wanted to avoid war. Uh, and he succeeded in the last by and large. The Metternich system was at work uh, first in Austria. Uh, we have to look at the internal policies of these uh, regions to look at the working of the so called system. Metternich wanted to first of all develop Austria as an ideal conservative state. There were two levels at which the system, so called system operated. One was the concert of Europe which we had seen already where Metternich intervened to suppress any uh, movement for change, particularly any insurrection or uprising. Internally he as I said earlier wished to develop uh, Austria into an ideal conservative state. What did this mean? It meant the introduction of measures that actually approximated to uh, what in modern parlance would be called a police state. Austria as it were was hermetically sealed from ideas coming into the empire. All foreign influences uh, ideological and otherwise uh, intellectual 
had to be totally excluded. A strict censorship system was introduced. The educational institutions were brought under control. The church in such circumstances always came in as a handmaiden of political conservatism. He also totally discouraged any uh, increase in the uh, self image of the ethnic minorities that they should not be allowed to develop uh, an identity of their own and therefore he made one and, and they must not be uh, allowed to combine the different ethnic minorities within the empire must not be allowed to combine again combine against the centralized empire and therefore people of troops of one uh, minority suppressed another the germans did duty in Czech dominated Bohemia, the Mogher soldiers of Hungary, they did duty in Italy to suppress the revolutions there. Uh, having done, uh, having tried to construct this idle state in Austria, Metternich also had the responsibility over Germany. Germany uh, was uh, made into a federation of 38 states, Austria as the 39th state was the president of the confederation. Metternich gave the same ruling here that govern and change nothing. He persuaded the king of Prussia not to grant a liberal constitution, but in some parts of Germany uh, there had been, uh, uh, well liberalism was a strong force. For example, in Bavaria, the regions that had been exposed to French influence for a longer period, but except in this region uh, the liberals drew blank elsewhere in Germany. But in Germany, the lib liberalism had a deeper root than in Austria. And therefore, in, after, in the years after 1815, gradually uh, a liberal movement was taking shape. New newspapers uh, or journals were being published. The Rhineland particularly was very active in this. Burschenschaft or fraternal society was created. Uh, many Burschenschaft and many fraternal societies came up in different regions and even a national league of the Burschenschaften of such fraternal societies was created. In 1817, they celebrated the 300 years of the rule of uh, movement of uh, Martin Luther and started the World Book Festival. So in Germany, liberalism was making, uh, proving to be a strong force and Metternich suppressed them by introducing the Kalbert decrees. All the universities which were hotbed of liberalism were brought under control, teachers and students were under uh, strict supervision and surveillance, all males were censored, even posts and posts were opened. There was a central investigative commission set up at Mainz. Identical was the situation in Italy. Italy had a shallow base of liberalism, but Metternich uh, introduced his system in all its uh, rigor in that area. But while this developed, the Metternich system gradually broke down. The first reverse came with the breakdown of the concert of Europe. The second was the July Revolution of 1830 in France. Uh, Austria was not directly affected, but there were echoes of this in Italy and Germany and Metternich had to send force to smother them. He had to accept the loss of Belgium. Belgium broke away from Holland and asserted its independence. Greeks earned its independence as well. Thirdly, in 1833, Prussia promoted Zollverein, which was an inoffensive customs union in which uh, many German states ultimately joined, but they consciously kept Austria out. The Zollverein quietly worked for German unity and in this unity, uh, well, uh, lay one of the defeats of uh, Metternich. This was seen uh, more clearly three decades later. And finally, when the February Revolution came in France in February 1848, its echoes uh, spread to the whole of uh, Europe. There was a mammoth demonstration in Vienna, the Austrian capital. Metternich was forced to resign and flee to an exile in England, never to return to Austria. Metternich 
was a very significant and important personality in early 19th century Europe. He did dominate the politics in the first half, but in assessing his significance, we have to understand the limitations of Metternich. He created a system that was rigid. It had become a doctrine of pure immobility because govern and change nothing was his motto. He failed to conceive of an alternative. He had no vision of an alternative system. He knew that he had inherited a complex decaying structure and he only felt that his time uh, was spent shoring up that ramshackle structure. In fact, he himself has said this, I was born either too early or too late. Earlier, I would have enjoyed life. Later, I would have helped in social reconstruction. Now my time is spent shoring up a decaying structure. This we may conclude by suggesting is an appropriate epitaph for a conservative in an era of change.